So, are we ready to start? It's like coaching under six soccer. Are you ready? Okay. So, uh, everything here is Creative Commons licensed. I think Michelle probably went through that. It's totally open. Please feel free to reuse with attribution. Um, this is, you know, we try to publish open access and so on. All right. Welcome. Module one, introduction. So, this is going to be less of a technical sort of introduction to metagenomics. As much as sort of a conceptual overview, we're going to talk about some detailed things in certain types of experiments, but my objective is to really get you thinking about metagenomics and then sort of starting off interacting with some of the resources. My tutorial, by the way, is on the wiki now, and as you'll see, it's really about trying to interact with the data, finding different ways to yoink the data down from the online resources so that you can get started with other people's data, should you have the courage to do so. I want to acknowledge a couple of really key contributors. So the first, of course, is the Canadian Bioinformatics Workshop, as represented by Michelle, but also as uh, sort of run and tremendously supported by Francis Lillet. Um, if you haven't met him, you totally should. He's a really, really fantastic guy. Uh, and Michelle and Francis have been extraordinarily busy over the last two months because this is the 10th this year, Michelle? 11th. 11th. Okay. Uh, and so at now we have the Center for Comparative Genomics and Evolutionary Bioinformatics. This is a range of researchers who work on sort of theoretical aspects, mathematical phylogenetics, uh, applied metagenomics, a lot of protistology, uh, really exciting creatures. And I've been listening to the taxonomy for 15 years. I still haven't learned it. Uh, Genome Atlantic is our local genome center that tries to facilitate connections and uh, try to bring basically more, uh, more research funding to uh, researchers in the region. And, oh, there, that's me. So these are my contact details, rbco at Dallas VA, and we're on Twitter. All right. Please, please make the most of your visit. And I'm, like I said, we're happy to, to help uh, facilitate anything that uh, you want to know about the region, anywhere you want to go. I know some of you are taking the opportunity to go camping or um, other things. All right. One thing I wanted to mention about Halifax before I finally shut up about Halifax is that there's a very important person who was born in Halifax, and that is Oswald Avery. Right. And so some of you may be familiar with this experiment. It was not the, you know, everybody's like, oh, Watson and Crick discovery of double-stranded DNA. I mean, that's fine, right? Okay, that's great. But the uh, this critical experiment demonstrated that the nucleic acid was the genetic material. Right? So some of you have probably learned this in, like, first or second year university, and I don't want to dwell too much on it because it's not the case. But the basic idea is that you've got two different strains of the nucleic acid, right? You've got the rough strain, which is non-virulent, cannot make mice sick or dead. And you've got the smooth strain, which is virulent, that makes mice very dead. So, all right. What happens if you kill the smooth strain? So you heat them up to some sort of temperature where they can no longer survive, they go, eh, and then you introduce them into the mice. Um, do we want to change the color scheme? I have no idea. Uh, I've not seen this window ever before. Uh, yeah, let's let's mess with that. Right on. Okay. So is that ten minutes and we have our first room? All right, so kill the pathogen, happy mice. But rough green mice might be Bye bye bye. Nucleic acid. Right? That's uh, so, rough strain plus DNA from smooth strain equals bad rough strain equals dead mice. So, Oswald Avery, changing the world forever. Here's the overview, right? So, we have six modules. Uh, the first one is delivered by me, Wong, and uh, basically talking about what we're talking about and different approaches sort of at a high level. And then we're going to investigate things in more depth. So Will Sow is at the back. Um, I don't know if you got introduced to Will. You'll get interested. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, he's going to be talking about sort of marker gene-based approaches, in particular the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Right? Uh, and then tomorrow is Metagenome Fest. So Morgan Langell is going to start in the morning with taxonomy and the afternoon with function. I feel like this is going to be a little bit about metagenomics. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute. Module 5 and 6, John Parkinson from the U of T, who's done a lot of methods development for metatranscriptomics, 
is going to be talking about the field and some of the crucial tools, and then a bit of a work through on some of that analysis. We're going to finish off the icing on the cake. It's going to be Friday afternoon, five markers to three. This is a lecture that is going to be delivered by John Parkinson uh, with a tremendous amount of input from Fiona Brinkman from Simon Fraser University, who I'm sure some of you know, uh, who uh, contributed a great deal to the development of this workshop, but could not make it due to other travel commitments. So we're very uh, disappointed that you can't make it, but uh, we'll do the spirit and then PowerPoint slides. What we wanted you to do, and I, I, I want to probably speed things a little bit, but the basic idea is what is the objective of your project, right? How do you deal with the raw data files? Uh, what are the standard pipelines and how do you run them? Uh, what do you do for the analysis? And then, of course, the, uh, critical, the crucial one, also known as the crucial or critical one, is to recognize the technical limitations of metagenomic studies, right? Because if you spend $60,000 on pack bio sequencing and you do an awesome metagenome, you're like, wow, we've discovered the key to... Somebody think of the keys. I was hoping for something more irrelevant. We've discovered the cure for malaise, right? Um, and then you submit it for review and they're like, this is the stupidest thing ever. You should have used Illumina instead of pack bio. Ah, okay, and then you get scooped. So these are very important considerations. Not all at the detailed analysis command prompt GUI level, right? So I, I sort of want to, to think about this at a few different levels to ensure for to try and maximize the chance that this can get done properly. So for my module, um, we're going to start by talking about some terminology, uh, semantics, uh, just because this is a discussion that comes up every time you talk about metagenomics. And so we, I just want to kind of make sure we're all on the same page as to what it is we're talking about over the next couple of days. Um, what are the objectives of a metagenomic experiment? What's the appropriate choice of technology? Uh, interpreting the contents of sequence files. So this is mainly, um, I mean, FASTA is like the simplest format ever. Uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a look at the FASTQ format, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with anyway uh, during the tutorial. And then Will is going to, uh, I think, uh, hit you full on with the uh, files and the processing and the Python and the whatever else he's got in store. Uh, and then one that we're going to focus on uh, is what are the online resources and what are the different modes of access we can get in order to bring these data closer to us? All right. Oh, actually, I'm going to ask. Um, and if you read that really quickly, don't put your hand up. Who wants to hazard a guess as to what, what a metagenome is or what is metagenomics? Come on, you're not all jet lagged. Breakfast here, coffee. That's great. And I think that is the closest to the original uh, Laterberg definition from 2000, right? Which is actually not really excitable because these people in 2001 said, yeah, uh, Laterberg said that. Okay, for Laterberg, personal communications to others. So um, the collective genome of our indigenous microbes, so exactly what uh, Alexander just said, um, and that using a comprehensive genetic view of Homo sapiens as a life form should include the genes in our microbiome. Another way of looking at it is that it's somewhat equivalent to the microbiome that organisms found in a particular setting, right? So hopefully you see the difference. In one case, it's all about the genes. In the other case, it's all about the things that contain the genes, right? And so either of these definitions is okay. I'll tell you right now that I tend to use this one about the microbes because that encompasses all of their genetic stuff and metabolomic things that are going on. Uh, and then the metagenome, so that's the microbiome. The metagenome is a term that's tossed around all the time in, in the press and in uh, mathematics workshops. So this is Joe Hamilton, 1998, right? Advances in molecular biology and eukaryotic genomics, which have laid the groundwork for cloning and functional analysis of the collective genomes of soil microflora, which we term the metagenome of the soil. Now, there's one really important thing about this, and actually Pat Schloss twigged this me to this a couple weeks ago. Where does it say sequencing? It doesn't, right? This 
is about cloning and functional analysis, right? So it's using the genetic material, but it's not necessarily sequencing it. And if you look at some of the first papers, such as of Joe Handelsman looking in at uh, AMR, antimicrobial resistance genes in, say, Alaska, it's not about sequencing. It's about let's blow up the environment, the microbes, that is, and clone random bits of DNA into uh, like plasmids and then express and see what we can find. No DNA sequencing required at all. So the purpose of these sort of uh, tedious introductions is just to try and make sure we know what we're talking about and make sure that we have sort of the right broad perspective on these things. Because, you know, you say these terms that, uh, oh, by the way, does not encompass marker gene surveys because it's not really useful. However, um, this report that was published a few years ago, The New Science of Metagenomics, Revealing the Secrets of Our Microbial Planet, uh, National Research Council of Canada, uh, Jeff, Claire Fraser, Jeff Gordon, Ford Doolittle, and uh, a number of others as well, uh, said that it did. So uh, marker genes, strictly speaking, according to the definition, not really, because if you do cloning of 16S and then do expression tests, that's kind of boring, right? So it's it, it's ambiguous, right? But let's just keep in mind that. What's the point? Well, I tried to come up with the simplest definition of why we do this stuff, and let's explore the relationship between microbes and their habitat. Hopefully that's a fair definition. Uh, and then how do we accomplish this? Well, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of, you know, experimental design, bioinformatics, statistics, hand-waving, and all that. And there are many, 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 many different ways to profile the community, right? Here are six. And actually, here's here's something that uh, we can do. So there are six that are main issues. I would like to put your hands up to indicate whether or not you have done this type of analysis. I think this would be a very interesting uh, survey. So, marker genes. Okay, over half the room. Metagenomes, right? So this is the environmental shotgun type stuff. Oh, about a third of you. Um, metatranscriptomes. Now we can count, right? One, two, three, four. Okay. Metaproteomes. And... Okay, zero. Uh, Metametabolomes. No. We're going to be doing some of this in a, in a couple of months. Excellent. Culturomes. What is a culturome? Yes. Yeah. So culturomics is a term specifically designed to make Jonathan Eisen very angry with you. But the objective is uh, the objective is to try and actually grow as many things as you can from a given sample. Why would you want to do that? Because hey, it's a mess in there. To the extent that we can tease certain organisms out, we might be better able to a sequence their genomes, b characterize their biochemistry, three grow them in more tight combinations with other organisms. And I have a beautiful example of that later on. It's not specifically culturomic, but it kind of takes you to part of the reason for culturomics. So, most people know about this. The great claim to anomaly, that's just capitalized. And the claim that has been made for decades, uh, including sort of in this seminal paper about marker gene analysis of Monet's all 1995, uh, is that fewer than 1%, less than 1%, fewer across many habitats are culturable, right? And so you take your dirt and you throw your dirt, well, you do your various dirt extraction things, and you try to grow it. And the, the things you get to grow are boring, right? It's like, oh, these are the things that'll grow anywhere. Whereas, you know, Mixococcus xanthus, Candidata, Sarangium, Cellulosum, whatever, those are like the exciting things and they won't grow because they have very specific requirements that you do not know about, right? And so if that's the case, that if you just do culturing, you get a very biased view of things. Okay? Um, and even if 50 or 70 or 80 percent was culturable, I mean, there's still two problems, right? One is that you still have 20 percent that you can't get at, right, through these traditional methods. The other is that if we're talking about the human microbiome, whatever that means, then you're culturing 500 things, right? That's a lot of very hardworking graduate students, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, now we have metagenomics, right, this sort of environmental shotgun approach, or indeed, if we use the broader definition, the marker gene approach, then we get this broader picture of, and to use the uh, sort of 
cliche, who is there and what are they doing, right? That's the point. Let me say that uh, the original definition of the microbiome was actually quite specific to humans, but it's generally accepted, um, at least among people that I talk to, that uh, this is a term that is relevant to any sort of habitat, any sort of biome on Earth, right? So when I say microbiome, I'm not just talking about humans. I'm talking about, uh, you know, soil, I'm talking about oceans, rivers, talking about hydrothermal vents, talking about wastewater ponds where graduate students get to carry shotguns to scare away the cold, the polar bears, uh, all of these things, right? And so the, the scale of the human microbiome, we'll talk through this for a moment, uh, so the host, Deal, right? How many genes do humans have? Well, somewhere between 20,000 and 25,000, I think. Typical. This is about 25,000 plus or minus a few thousand. Now, your typical human gut microbiome sample will have on the order of greater than 160 species. It can be several hundred species, as in scare quotes, because we lack a good definition of species. Uh, and, you know, over a million different genes. Okay. So in terms of functional diversity, of course, humans have all these confusing things like introns and shuffling and intines and whatever that make me glad I don't work with them. So there is more complexity than that number 25,000 would imply. But, I mean, this is, this is significant. This is substantial. Right? And it's true of any, any biome on Earth. The microbes are really driving the function. Um, I want to kind of get at the roots of metagenomics, just because I think it's important to, to kind of take a look back and see where the field has come from, some of the techniques that have emerged over time. So, um, no, I won't do that yet. We'll get to that. Okay. Let's start in the 1970s, which by which I actually mean the 1950s. Because one Nobel Prize is not enough, he got his first Nobel Prize for sequencing the protein uh, sequence of insulin, right? Um, 1960 was actually the first DNA sequencing method. It was not very useful. I mean, it was amazing at the time, right? But it doesn't give you everything. Basically, what it did was it knocked out a series of these mentally inactivated amino acid tracks, right? So, isn't it interesting? Because those of you who know about, you know, various sequencing technologies now, that homo purine or homo they were actually the only things that people could see, sequence 45 years ago, 55 years ago. And of course, uh, if you don't know about Margaret Bayhoff, you should. Uh, she was a pioneer in many ways. Uh, she's been referred to as the mother and father of bioinformatics. And one of the key advances was the Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure, which was the first collection of all proteins that had been sequenced to date. I forget the exact number, but I think it was somewhere between 50 and 100. The 1970s, we start to see official uh, algorithms for alignments and the first efforts at sequencing, right? So Sanger plus minus, Maxim Gilbert, which uh, I understand is a horrific way of sequencing. It's the chemicals are extremely toxic. And then the revolution in 1977 was the Sanger guide oxy chain termination. Paper's been cited over 64,000 times. This is what got him his second Nobel Prize in 1980. Right? So the turnaround time, it was like, okay, so this is significant. Also in 1977, uh, the first major um, HTML project, the discovery of the Archaea, right? This sort of Carl Woe's, George Fox, uh, tree of microbial life. Also in 1977, uh, where is it? Oh, I think I've got it on the next slide, so we'll, we'll see that in a second. Uh, 1977, the Staden Bioinformatics uh, uh, software. And the Staden package in 1979 added the first method for automated sequence assembly. Okay. So, 1979. The continuing rapid fall in the cost of computer components is making it possible for most DNA sequencing laboratories to have their own small computer. Right. Uh, the fact that DNA sequencing is now a fast procedure and the availability of computers gives the possibility of more efficient overall strategy sequence determination. Holy crap, look at all the data, right? Every paper in bioinformatics now starts with, holy crap, look at the data. So here is the genesis of this Isn't it amazing? So 1970s, this is what I was going to say. Genome sequence, 1977, by X, right? 
now it's the genome that's more sequenced than any other because you dump it into your mice. So you can try to resolve some of these clustering issues. Uh, and so here it is, all its glory, nature, February 24th, 1977. Um, the whole genome. 48 years ago. This one's pretty neat, too. So, gene uh, 4 was determined in 1974, 1975, 76. But it wasn't through sequencing. It was through really um, deep recombination analysis, right? Mutations, um, other really you know difficult and time-consuming techniques. So this map is not based on DNA sequence. It's based on you know at least 20 years of experimental biology. So these are the first uh, you know recorded discoveries. Okay, 1980s. 1980, Dr. Dayhoff established an online computer database and a sophisticated retrieval system accessible by phone to outside users in September 1980. So, imagine, okay, and I don't know exactly how it worked because I was three when it came out, but you call in, right, and you're like, press one for insulin. M, A, R, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I laugh, but it's, it's remarkable for this is, so we're getting to what I call the dawn of metagenomics, okay? Because in 1984 and 1985, more recently, developed the first methods for sequencing genes from microbial communities without culturing, okay? This is where it all started. They did not sequence the seed and the gene. They sequenced the ribosomal RNA directly, okay? But this is where it all began. 1985, 30 years ago. Two, uh, hydrothermal vents, and then this octopus spring with that thinker gene yellow, so it's supposed to be yellow cell in the center. Mid 1980s, and this paved the way for everything that came after the data, the first data sharing agreement between NIH in the US, EMBL in Europe, and JNIG in Japan. Right? Let's mirror things, let's share the data, let's make it open. Thank you very much. Right? Finally, geography, 1987. This, this, Certainly playing an important role in, in, uh, in various environmental metagenomics. 1988 and 1989, ribosomal database project funded, right? So, um, they've come a long way. On uh, metagenomics, right? We have a couple of reference sequences from Sulfalobus to Sinicaldarius, these have been determined previously, Thermus uh, Aquaticus, Thermus Thermopolis, and then the environmental RNA, and here are the alignment of sort of environmental sequences that were characterized on maps. Very simple communities, but it was Automated into, yeah. So um, the basic idea is that it's really expensive to sequence back in 1999. So let's use restriction digest <coughs> for digestion and some sort of gel-based approach or some other size typing-based approach, such that you know your intergenic transcribed sequence between your 16S and your 23F and mine are slightly different, but hopefully they have sequence variations that lead to differences in restriction sites. So even even uh, more even very recently, you see papers published that are based on ERISA. It doesn't give you as much information as others do, and it can be difficult to do automatic attribution, but it's still quite useful. Okay, 2000 things start to heat up. By the way, uh, okay, 2000, that is the only protocol that drops in So, Life 
harvesting method of video. Definition of microbiome. 2004, sir. Uh, pretty much doubled the size. Uh, acid mine drainage metagenomics, Jill Banfield. Acid mine drainage metatranscriptomics, Jill Banfield. 2005, acid mine drainage metaproteomics, Jill Banfield. Right? So she led the way in a lot of this stuff in the mid 2000s. Also, do a lot of screening and So there's a very, very few thinkers about metagenomics. Obesity and twins starting to get into the human microbiome studies. Four five, four five, or five, sampling. And then the two major human microbiome projects were one in 2006, Medicaid HMP, and then the European MetaHit project. Okay, we're reaching the end. For, uh, and so here we have the high sequence. We get more and more sequencing of metagenomics. Uh, Time is published in 2010, the human microbiome project is launched in 2010. My CEO, uh, Jessica Green, many of you know of has been probably the leader in the advancement of microbial ecology into the sequencing era, right, into the sort of metagenomics era. So a lot of these sort of beta diversity methods, different statistics, uh, different environmental correlates are due to her and the collaborators. Uh, in 2013, the strictly bioinformatics lab sequenced fecal samples from 21 mice. So we do computational stuff, and we're like, hey, we have $6,000, what can we do with it? Boom. <laughs> so this is just an illustration of how accessible it's becoming. 2013 crowdsourced, 2014 oxygen nanopore mid-ion released. <clears throat> we're getting ours in a few weeks. We're very excited. And the other thing about this decade is that with the greater accessibility of sequencing for very low cost, you start to see interesting things like the microbiome of roller derby, right? And that's actually Jessica Green. Uh, kissing, I got a lot of attention last year, the kissing microbiome. Uh, mobile phones, American Cool Shift Ale, Irish rugby players. Mike just pointed me out to the sports surfaces microbiome, which was like workout tables and stuff like that. Why did they do that? Okay, we'll have to ask that later on, Jack Gilbert. Uh, and artisanal cheese, which actually I would love to have been involved in that. Okay, so that's history. History is history. Any questions so far? Apart from when are you going to get to the point? I don't know how to answer that part. Any questions? 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 Okay. Yeah, watch out. Wisconsin. Who was it? Who was she? Anybody know? I forget. Anyway, Sanger. So the early metagenome, you know, 10 years ago, the early metagenome studies were Sanger. They assembled them and then handed out as a few of the maps and test battles. These days, and I'm going to show you an example later on. They're doing it. Um, so it's not restricted to Illumina or PacBio or 454 or Nanopore or anything specific like that. Okay, great. So this is the very, 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 very high level view of how these things are done, right? It's the big picture. The big picture, you have a sample. And read meta only. Okay, well, this is the metagenomes, metatranscriptomes, metaproteomes, marker gene, whatever, right? You see, it's very important. And I mean, this is one of the critical things of late 2000s, early 2010s, was the development of appropriate quality control protocols. Right? And one of the papers that I included in your, um, your recommended package, which is not that, it's here somewhere, Bioinformatics for the Human Microbiome Project. So this doesn't go into the details, but it cites the details. This is basically saying we had more data than anyone had ever dealt with before. We needed to do the analysis quickly and well, right? And so they talk about some of the 16S analysis challenges they faced. And they did things like building mock communities. 
So basically, what's a mock community? It's like, okay, I have in you go, in you go, Scrappy Caucus and Millennia, in you go. What time is it, Michelle? You're kidding me. Okay, see, I warned you, didn't I? Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, okay. uh, so, and then the, the downstream analysis. So, by the way, just very quickly, my plan was to go as far as I could before the coffee break, or before Zubin gives me very important time. And then after coffee break, so after Zubin is coffee break, after co coffee break, I figured we'd dive into the tutorial, maybe for an hour, and then save the last half hour to uh, finish up with this. I think that's a reasonable balance of things. Um, uh, marker genes, extract DNA, amplify with targeted primers, right? You can look at B1, you can look at B2, B2, B4, B3, B5, B6, B9, uh, filter errors, fill clusters. If you don't know what I just said, you'll learn about it this afternoon. And then various types of diversity analysis. Edit genomes, same idea, extract DNA, sequence random fragments. Uh, quality control, maybe. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then your various diversity functional analysis, metabolic pathway reconstruction, or what have you. Metatranscriptomics, which I'm very excited for Friday because I haven't really done this myself. So I'm really looking forward to John's session. Um, you know, extract RNA, get rid of the ribosomal RNA because, well, it, it's actually quite informative. And Jessica Green had a great paper on how ribosomal RNA levels can actually tell you many things about a community. But in terms of function, Uh, quality control, and then you can look at function, gene expression, taxonomy, the usual suspects. One of the papers that I'm going to give a very brief overview of later on, uh, an example of how the metatranscriptome can be orders of magnitude more informative than the metagenome. It's chaos, right? You say, okay, well, any samples can run the 16 s ribosomal RNA pipeline, because you have some metadata, which is like these samples in this small, let me be specific. These samples came from older mice, these from middle aged mice, and these from younger mice. And so we map them in some sort of taxonomic representation. In this case, uh, and again, you'll be learning about this this afternoon, so don't worry about it too much. It's a principal components plot, and it's a principal coordinates plot, uh, which basically tries to take all the diversity, smoosh it down into a couple of manageable dimensions, and then show you the similarities. Well, that's that's another matter entirely. Okay. Um, so I have some papers to talk about. Uh, Michelle, how much time do I have? Okay. So just, just to kind of give some motivating examples of some really cool work that's been done in the last few years, I wanted to walk through a few different examples of Meta genomics, meta omics, whatever you want to call it, right? And I haven't put these papers up, but um, they are cited in the talk. And if I remember, which means if you remind me, I can also throw them up on the wiki later on. Okay. These are some of my favorite pieces. Well, some of these are my favorite, and then a couple of them I discovered fairly recently. So it's always good when you're explaining meta genomics to your mom and your dad and your neighbor to start with clustering your genome, right? Because, hey, that's one of the most prominent examples of, you know, the discovery, the use, the application, the success of essentially a metagenomic approach, right? or a microbiome approach, right? we're going to take examine these metagenomics. And so this is from 2012, uh, pathogen, Trevor Wally, uh, at the Sanger Center, and a cast of thousands, or at least a dozen or so, looked at We have these different mice and we've taken samples from them, right? Who's there? What microbes are there? Well, there's various techniques to take the sequence of these microbes. The sample in terms of its taxonomic function. Well, the sample drives, well, this is one of the things I like to 
that, when you represent it this way, there's sort of some Captain Obvious stuff going on, right? So, what I seen as a sign of a problem. But this is just the community profile. Right? Now, who knows what Shannon diversity is? Okay. So Shannon diversity is, okay, so let me back the truck up for a second. Richness. Shannon diversity takes that a step further and tries to uh, uses information-based approaches to try and accommodate, accommodate both the richness and the diversity. What's the diversity? It's the relative abundance of different things, right? Because a richness of 10, where the distribution is 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%,
coffees, and the other are lactobacillus. So this is your probiotic yogurt, yogurt that you eat in the morning with your fruit juice or whatever. Uh, blue is toxic one. What's toxic one? One, which takes the, the healthy microbes and uses them and throw it overnight in culture. So that's it, right? So this should be a bit simplified. And then this one is interesting, the green one, next B. What is next B? Well, it's a subset. It's a chosen subset from the healthy microbiota. Because what's in the poop of a mouse? I don't know. You know, right? If you're a mouse, do you want to take a donation from something where you don't know what's there? Maybe not. Mix B, they took six things. They put them together, and they said, how well does this work? Okay, so these are the three steps. And the procedure indicates how these things Let's start with the, the sort of uh, straw man of the mice and the mice. So they uh, have a little Cream. After three days of treatment. After four days of treatment, six days of treatment, 14 days of treatment, what do they do? Um, Now let's do You've got sickness, you've got health, you've got different treatments. And actually, the geography of this weird abstract plot thing tells you a huge amount of information. Okay? So I think I'm at time for this morning. Okay, will do. Okay? Hopefully people's brains are not full yet. Absolutely. Any questions about this? Okay. Good. It's all clear. It all makes sense. All right. This is, these are some of my favorite papers. And this one is, is in my um, humble, humble opinion, kind of underappreciated. Metagenomics, the environment, and ecology, and the results are really nice. Okay. Yes? Of course, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. With passage, you've got a medium that will selectively favor certain things over others. And I, I do not recall what the composition of the medium is. Oh, community. Because, yeah, I mean, if, if passage worked well, then it makes sense to subsample from that one to try and get a simpler community. Absolutely. Other questions about uh, feeding various things to the very sick mice? All right. A trial called Genome Research 2010. So we like this so much, we actually implemented it in uh, some of our software, again, which for, for geographic analysis of microbial communities. Quite complicated. But let me start by asking if any of you are familiar with canonical correlation analysis. 
Okay. How many of you are familiar with principal components analysis beyond the thing I just showed you? Okay. So PCA is a mapping of these complicated patterns of diversity or function into a smaller set of dimensions that hopefully capture most of the information that you had before. But you can visualize because two dimensions is cool, right? 37,000 dimensional complicated. So databases. And over here, we have the same set of But this is not all of the metagenome. This is membrane proteins. This is transporters. They focused on those specifically. Changes in environmental conditions. That is why they focus on those. Okay, so again, don't always think the whole data set. Focus on the things that are of greatest importance. So we have two matrices. Long story short, it's these two matrices. You actually get information. Visualized together, you can see strong correlations between environments of family and family, but you also see cross correlations. Very powerful technology for decades. Okay, it's cool that they applied it, but they took it a step further. Okay, because. Maybe they're anti-correlated. You don't know. So what they did is they took the uh, ordinates that you get out of the other ones, associations between those not in the plot but in there. What is the relationship between um, shipping and this phosphate transporter? Right. I'll finish this one and then. Uh, yeah. Uh, thought I was going to get more quickly. Um, and so let's look at those numbers, those values. Let us draw an edge between them and let the green edges represent strong positive associations and let the red edges represent strong or pen. What do you end up with? You end up with these really nice little things. And let me just focus in on this one. Here's the environment. So this affects, there's a relationship, because we shouldn't infer too much causality, there's a relationship between these things. And the phenotype environment network makes it very clear. Any questions about that? I have three more examples, but I think it's time for me to hand over to uh, Jibin. Questions? Great. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome back. So I just wanted to follow up with, I think Daniel had this question beforehand. This is from that uh, from the, the mouse paper, right? 
And so, diverse collection of 18 bacterial species from the passive one fecal derivative. So they had 18 different species, so-called. They split them into the three mixes. Mix A was six of them, mix B was six of them, and mix C was six of them, the Dr. Seussian. Uh, and this is basically showing that mix A and mix C did not reduce the uh, colony forming units of C. diff. Mix B did, so that was the successful one. And then they characterized the six species in mix B, Staph warneri, Enterococcus pyrae, Lactobacillus reuteri, and then three novel species, species novum, species novum, species novum. Okay, so that's, that's the story of mix B. Okay, so I'm going to go through the, 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 the remaining three examples a bit more quickly, hopefully. Um, this is a, a very recently published, uh, beautiful example of what you can do with metagenomes plus metatranscriptomics, both in terms of working up the data and interpreting the data. And I'm not going to dwell on this. It's, like I said, I'll, I'll put the reference up if someone can remind you later. Uh, but the basic idea is that you have raw metagenomic and raw cDNA metatranscriptomic data, <coughs> quality control. And what they did was interesting. So they split their metagenomes, because metagenomes are big and complicated, right? <coughs> now, this was an acid mine drainage community, so it's a lot less complicated, but it's still complicated. There's still a few different things in there. So they actually split their metagenome based on Kamer abundance. What's a Kamer? Who knows what a Kamer is? Kamer, OK. So somebody give me 10 letters of DNA. Come on. CG. C G. A T. A T. What's that? Stretch of A's. <laughs> a A A. Seven. Okay. T. I'm going to throw in a G and C. C. Perfect. Okay. So uh, this is a sequence of DNA. One way to figure out, one way to represent it is by doing a blast search, comparing it against a database and then trying to figure out what it matches to. Another way to deal with this is to decompose it into Kamers. So Kamers are words of length K. So if we, can ex if we want to express this in terms of Kamers of length 2, Kamers of length 2 are dimers, right? And so we can say, how many CGs do we have? Well, we have one. How many GAs? We have one. How many ATs? One, two, right? So you see how we're counting words of a given length. So, uh, and we have two AAs, for example. So that's, that's the Kamer decomposition. You're just counting words of a certain length. Words of different lengths are useful for different purposes. Here they used uh, words of length, oh, I think it was 12, but I forget. Um, and they basically separated them into high abundance words, which might come from high abundance species, and low abundance words. So they're taking their metagenome, and they're actually fractionating it out so that the resulting things are simpler. And then there's some garbage left, not garbage, but there's some leftovers that they scoop up and put back together. So they get contigs that are theoretically better than you would just get from naive metagene assembly. Right? They assemble their RNAs. They do clustering, and they build these contigs. They claimed 11 draft genomes from this AMD sample, which is pretty cool. So what's really neat about this, in addition to that, is that, so here are 11 different things, the 11 species or types or whatever you want to call them to identify. These are the abundances, the relative abundances of their DNA, i.e. metagenome, versus cDNA, i.e. RNA, i.e. metatranscriptome, right? And so you can see that FKB7, which is ferrovum, ferrovum, uh, was over 98% of the DNA. And in transcriptional terms, it's about 92%. Right? So you get a relationship. You can see that sort of, uh, sort of a naive assumption that DNA and RNA levels should be the same. It's actually kind of underproducing. Right? And then look at FKD1. It's <coughs> way less than 1%, but its transcriptional contribution is over 1%. It's punching above its weight in functional terms. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. And so there's the really, really common thing, and then there are the rare things. And here's the crucial outcome of the paper. There are critical functions, such as uh, nitrogen fixation that are going on in the community. Who's doing them? The rare things, okay? FKB1, uh, no, what's the example? F, yeah, FKB1, right? Very rare, less, far less than 1% of the community, doing most 
of the nitrogen fixation, almost all of the nitrogen fixation coming from this one little dude, right? What is it? Acidify bacillus ferrooxidans, which is interesting for a whole range of reasons. It's one of my favorite organisms. Uh, and then you can see sulfate reduction being carried out by FKB7, so that, that's pretty common. But then other functions, you know, you can see that other rare individuals are carrying out certain other crucial functions, right? Metagenomics wouldn't really tell you this, necessarily. Metatranscriptomics does, yeah? Plus you get 11 draft genomes, so that's really cool. Okay, uh, this is um, not as recent, but it's just a very quick example of uh, metabolomics or metametabolomics in bacterial vaginosis. Okay. And I don't want to dwell on this too much. It's basically showing you that there are more than there, there, there's more than one approach, right? And so what they had here, they had I forget the exact number, but each of these was an individual either uh, negative for bacterial vaginosis or positive. And so this is a heat map, and we've all seen heat maps, right? Hotter colors represent higher amounts of something, right? And so this, this really super red box here means that, um, let's see, we're five. Individual 50, to make that up. individual 50 has a lot of that metabolite, manila. No, I don't know what that is. Um, you get the idea, right? And so these are all metabolites that were profiled using NMR, right? Okay? Not genes, not transcripts, not proteins, metabolites, which is really cool because you get some functional information at the kind of business end of, of the managing of the microbiome. So they have two main clusters, each of which comprises people with and without BV. Uh, and you can see immediately that some metabolites are critically important in distinguishing both this cluster and that cluster, and then uh, BV positive, right? So here's an example of something that distinguishes so on balance, they, they concluded that catabolic pathways for things like amino acids and peptides were uh, overrepresented because of the products they found. Okay. So, nice example. And then they did taxonomy, because hey, you gotta do taxonomy. Uh, these are the kind of good guys over here, the uh, lactobacillus, lactobacillus, lactobacillus. And these are sort of the, the dog breakfast of other organisms that are not as uh, nice. Okay. And so just, again, metabolites by organism. All right, last one. So this is a, a, a great paper, and I think this is the preprint. I think the paper is actually 2015. So this was a paper by a large number of authors. Senior author was Marty Blazer, who was one of the best known microbiome types. And the purpose of this study was to investigate the effects of low dose antibiotics, specifically penicillin, on physiological and metabolic development of mice from birth, right? So lots of people are put on uh, you know, prophylactic antibiotics and things like that for various reasons, early in life, later in life, and so on. And the question is, what are the consequences of this? We know that you're beating down certain parts of the microbiome when you do this. What are the effects, right? So they went a lot further. They went a lot further than just characterizing the microbiome. You need to look at this paper. It's got five figures and a total of 92 panels, uh, which is, I was like, what crucial panel can I pull out? So I chose the best 10. Uh, but here's the experimental design, basically. Control, right, no antibiotics. This is gestation, nursing, and then normal rat chow, or mouse chow. Uh, control, no antibiotics. LDP and weaning, blue, right, so the antibiotics started here at four weeks. And the uh, B was birth, basically a little bit before birth. So during nursing and uh, during a mouse chow, they, uh, they got the low-dose antibiotics. And then they characterized things a million ways, right, and just let me draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, growth rates were different. Where's the critical one? Fat mass, right? So male and female mice, they found that the fat mass was significantly higher for the LDP group from birth. Right? And they found different diet responses and so on and so forth. And so this is really interesting because they're looking at causal mechanisms. They're looking at these relationships, not just who's there, but what are the effects? So that's kind of interesting. And hey, let's uh, get some taxonomy going, right? And so they had, these are the low-dose penicillin in red. This is the control group. And this is simply a phylogenetic tree with all the little dudes they found, the bacteria that is. And uh, red is overrepresented in LDP, and green is overrepresented in control. And so you can see, for example, that FS247G, I love the LDP taxonomy, is overrepresented in 
the low dose penicillin, whereas other things over here, for example, are overrepresented controls. So you get taxonomic views, but they have histology and they have physiological assays and all sorts of things. So it's 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 in cell. It's quite a remarkable paper. I strongly encourage you to look at it. Okay, so let's do another quick survey. Um, so you're doing data analysis. That's cool. Uh, how many people have used Sanger data? Nice, most of you. That's great. Ion torrent. Okay, a couple of you. Very nice. Roche four five four. Yeah. Yeah, a classic. Uh, Illumina something seek, high seek, my seek. Nice. Okay, so there, there's your market share right there. Uh, the pack bio multiple freezers stacked on top of each other. Yeah? Nice. Um, and then the Oxford Nanopore. Ask me in a couple months. Very excited. Uh, Michelle? Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, so obviously, in choosing a sequencing technology, there are many, 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 many trade-offs, such as sequence read length, right? So who's the winner? Depends what you're doing with it. Depends on what you're doing with it. Um, so arguably, so I think in terms of claim read length, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. Does so, would anybody disagree with that? So Nanopore longest, Pack Bio next, then Sanger, then 454, then Illumina, then Ion Torrent. Illumina, Ion Torrent are kind of tied, I think. Yeah. My seek may exceed the Ion Torrent. Accuracy. We care about accuracy, right? So what's the most accurate? Illumina, Illumina Sanger. I think it's Sanger, Sanger. right? Sanger. Sanger, yeah. So Sanger is pretty good. And then I think uh, Illumina and 454, of course, yeah. I mean, it's sort of, you know, you've got the generally reported error parameters, and then there's different ways to run these things, uh, different modes, different levels of accuracy. So I think, in general, these three, 454, four, ion, torrent, alumina, you can kind of run to roughly the same error level. And then we have the last two, right? Pack bio, which gives you super long reads, uh, and nanopore, which gives you ultra long reads. But the error rates in both cases are still hovering around 10%, depending on which papers you read and who you listen to. And so depending on your purpose, uh, different examples of these will be most suitable. So what would you use to sequence a genome, for example? Because we love genomes. Depends on your genome. OK, uh, pick a genome. Ours, we have Sanger 454 Illumina and Black or two and a half times the size of the which which genome is that? Cal fever tip it's not finished, that's the problem. Okay. So you're finishing it with a range of technologies. Yes. Yeah. So all paths, the assembly algorithm, combines the latest version I know of combines pack bio with um, paired end alumina with make paired alumina, if I recall correctly. So you've got paired end reads that are close to each other, paired end reads that are long away from each other, and then the pack bio long reads, which are much more error prone. So in general, if you want really good quality something, you typically don't have one that gives you everything you want, right? And so a lot of people choose Illumina. Hey, it's cheap, hey, it gives a lot of data, it's reasonably accurate, and especially with a MySeq, you can get some level of assembly, right? But these are all very important considerations. Um, you know, pack bio seems to have settled in a certain error profile Nanopore is getting better all the time, and people are developing new algorithms to better interpret the signals as they come off the machine. So what's this picture going to look in, like in five years? I have no idea. Will we still be talking about metagenomics in five years? I have no idea. OK, so the thing we're going to almost finish with, uh, and then we're going to explore in the tutorial a little bit, are different resources. I'm just going to run through these very quickly. Um, so 16S, right? I mean, 16S has been the de rigueur gene of choice ever since Carl Woese and George Fox and so on said, let's sequence something, right? That should be like, you know, nanopore, let's sequence something, trademark. <laughs> and so these repositories, as I showed you, have been in place in a formal way since the late 1980s. RDP uh, and Silva and Green genes all have, uh, I think, over a million sequences in them. Green genes is interesting because of its automated approach to taxonomy, right? And so, as you'll see in the tutorial, if you take the same data set and you feed it through green genes, 
Silva for RDP2, you will get somewhat different conclusions. In the example I've given you, you will get very different conclusions as to whether a sample contains eukaryotes or not. Hint. No, I'm not going to give you a hint. You'll see. <laughs> this is the RNA, a ribosomal RNA copy number database. What is the largest copy number of 16S genes known in any organism to date? 16. What's that? 16. I know of 15. What has 16? Okay, 15 I think is the record, and of course I'm blanking on which organism it is, but uh, many E. coli typically have I think six or seven ribosomal operons, right? And so you're going to learn about pie crust, which is predicting functions from taxonomy, and in general if you have a taxonomic profile, an organism that has seven ribosomal RNA genes is going to be overrepresented because it has seven, you know, as opposed to the ones that have a single copy. Most things have single copies. Most things that have more than one copy, if you build a tree with a bunch of things, their copies will cluster together in the tree and be a clay. So it's like, okay, these are all representative of uh, Candidata syringium cellulosum soci, and they're all kind of here, right? Halo archaea can have 16 s that diverge by greater than 10%. Where do they go in the tree? Don't ask me. Okay, genomes, right? Because genomes are the things from which metagenomes are constructed. Uh, GenBank is a good resource, of course. Um, Lots of modes of access and sort of the default place to put genomes, although they're not all there now. Gold is really nice because it has information. It's designed to adhere to some of these minimal standards for sequence specifications, right? We haven't talked about metadata quality, but you should try to have some, right? And so gold has a wide range of fields to say where was it extracted from, what was the method used to sequence it, and so on. So that's very good. Gold has been around forever. Uh, Patrick is the pathogen resource, so they have a nice set of, uh, of features as well, including trees of, of different organisms. Uh, and then Ensemble uh, has, has both pro, uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic genomes as well. Uh, there's no shortage of resources, there are others as well. We're not doing a comprehensive survey, I'm just kind of introducing you to a couple. Okay, metagenomes. So uh, this is one I have less experience with, but Mike has been using a lot of it, so if you have questions. I encourage you, like he's been using it at sort of the, the, the basic level, uh, to query things, these APIs and things like that. EBI is pretty good for that. MGRAST uh, also has a really nice API, and we will be looking at that one in the uh, tutorial, including what an API is. Uh, and then uh, one that we've used a fair bit is the Human Microbiome Project Data Analysis and Coordination Center, the HMP DAC, uh, which has all of the HMP data. Right. Metadata, 16S, metagenome reads, metagenome assemblies, you name it, right? it's all there. And so there are big questions about the size of the database, the reliability of the database, the completeness of the database, how do you access the database. Right? So we're going to look at a few of those things. Okay. Function. So function is, is a great term because nobody knows what function means. Nobody knows how to define it. Nobody knows how to predict it, because even the best characterized genomes typically have about 30% hypothetical proteins, right? the predicted hypothetical proteins. And if you're familiar with the Schnoys at all paper 2009, even the ones that have functional annotations are sometimes wrong. And for some functional uh, categories, they're always wrong. Right? Uh, and so the key trade-off in looking at a functional database is coverage versus accuracy. Okay, and so KEG is an example of high coverage, but not the best accuracy. Actually, I talk about the Shnoas at all paper in a moment. Um, but then you have Uniprot KB is neat, because there's the Swiss prot side and there's the Tremble side. And the Swiss prot, as far as I know, is the most highly curated, the most accurate, most reliable resource for protein function. Therefore, its coverage is the smallest, right? Stands to reason. Uh, and then there's Unipro KB Tremble, which is more sort of predicted functions, which gives you greater coverage at the cost of slightly lower accuracy. Gene ontology has decent coverage. One of the really nice things about Go is that you get evidence codes. So it tells you the function, and it tells you where that function came from, right? So there's uh, inferred from, I think it's inferred from direct assay or something, right? Experimental validation, and there's different classes of that. All the way down to person uh, came back to the lab after a pub crawl, ran blast, hopefully with the right settings, and assigned a function that came from E. coli via Salmonella, via Citrobacter, via Staphylococcus, 
to Halo, uh, Halo Player Adam Wall's BI, right? So there's, there's sort of that range of evidence codes. You could say, for this analysis, I'm going to focus on the things that had experimental evidence, right? Card is new and very cool. This is the antibiotic resistance gene database. This is being developed by uh, Andrew. Of course. It'll come to me. Andrew at uh, McMaster University. MacArthur. That's it. Andrew MacArthur. Uh, and so it's meant to be a highly curated, highly accurate resource for antibiotic resistance genes. Obviously something that's getting a lot of attention these days. Okay, so questions? I have one last section before we get into the tutorial. But I'm probably going pretty fast, so feel free to stop me and ask questions. Michelle, yes, five minutes. Okay, major concerns in metagenomic analysis, right? Here's one, right? Data quality. So we talked a bit about errors, right? So there's error rates, which are often quoted, and then there's error types, right? So some sequencing platforms get gummed up on, uh, you know, tracts of a certain type of nucleotide. Others have a tendency to induce, induce more insertions and deletions. Some have biases in favor of certain types of call. So this is something that can really influence your results as well. And then there are the, uh, the, the chimeras, right? And so those of you who have worked with 16S data are hopefully familiar, hopefully familiar with uh, things like uh, Chimera Slayer, for example, or uh, Bellerophon, although I think that one's a bit older, because if you're PCR, uh, PCRing, so if you're find that, a bunch of uh, 16S genes, often during the process, you'll get recombination, right? You get these chimeras, these hybrids, yeah. I was just wondering, if your workflows for that, are you, are you, is there a trend towards more labs doing dual indexing strategy to work around this on my scene? Not Which sure. I wish I was doing with my work, because it would be helpful, but I'm not to my knowledge. I'm not sure, actually. It's a really good question. Uh, so you're, is anyone using the dual indexing approach? I know Pat's published on it. Pat's Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, I think most people are still using the chime defaults, I think. But uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, all right. Comparability, reproducibility. But there was a paper, and I can't remember, I think it was from the Rob Knight group. I think there have been a few papers, but the one I remember was that one, where a bunch of you know metagenome sequence from a bunch of different samples, and you run your piece peak away, and you get your you know, show me several of these plots already, right? And say, what clusters, right? And it was one of those cases where they had 454 in Illumina data, and the primary criterion for clustering is whether the sample had been sequenced using 454 or Illumina, right? And so one thing that I really like to do is meta-analysis, combining many data sets, and with sequenced genomes, especially finished genomes, this is kind of okay, although there are still assumptions. But if you're trying to grab a whole bunch of 16S or particularly metagenomic data or metatranscriptomes, if you can find them, the sequencing platform can have a huge impact on the results you get. Right? Uh, this is true with 16S with different variable regions. Right? People have done studies where they're like, you know, your diversity profile is like this if you do V13 and like that if you do V35. Right? So that's a problem. Uh, and I meant to include a citation to this. I'll, I'll, I'll add that to the... Uh, the website, but basically uh, building some of these mock communities and then trying different uh, extraction strategies, DNA extraction strategies, and different sequencing strategies, you know, whether it's amplicon based or, or uh, shotgun based, and getting very different accuracy results in the outcome, of whether they were able to recapture the community or not. Uh, and then, you know, read the methods section. We use Chime version 2.3.6. Point upside a happy face uh, dot apps ampersand which uses UCLUS version this, which uses, you know, RDP version 15, release 15, whatever. Uh, reproducibility is a massive, massive thing, right? There are solutions like Galaxy for workflows, which really, um, you know, do encourage reproducibility. Several people have been written about reproducibility of, of uh, bioinformatics analyses in general. I strongly encourage you to look those things up and try to adhere to them as much as you can, as well as making your data public, but you already knew that. This is my favorite example. Okay, I'm almost done, almost done. Um, and so this is, so Morgan's presenting the metagenomic stuff tomorrow. This is our mouse poop study. I showed you a very similar plot earlier. I apologize for the dots being so small, 
But we had 21 samples, okay, from 21 mice, old, middle-aged, and young. So very, very small study, right, a pilot. Uh, and we said, all right, we can do these comparisons, but wouldn't it be nicer if we had a larger reference data set? Okay, well, let's compare them against the larger set to see how they stack up. We're like, well, people have sequenced mouse poop all over the place, right? It's like, it's a giant cottage industry. There was even a paper where they sequenced the fecal microbiome of five or six different healthy mouse strains and compared them. Right? And of course, their strain, mouse strain effects, so that's great. So I, I asked Morgan in my other postdoc at the time, Connor, to grab these other data sets, put them with our 21 samples, and then do like a PCOA analysis and see whether the old or the young or the middle aged tended to cluster more closely with the mice that people had seen, the most poop that people had sequenced earlier. And guess what? The reference, all of the reference sequences occupy this tiny little part of the plot, and ours are like boom all over the place. Right? Comparability? No. Wouldn't it be nice? But it's a bit of a fantasy. I mean, we could have tried harder and gone back to the raw sequences and tried to sort it out, but even then, we'd probably just be asking for trouble. Okay. Linkage and resolution, strain level diversity is often missed by amplicon and shotgun approaches. And in many cases, uh, you know, strain level diversity is crucial. Often, whether your wastewater treatment plant works or not depends on which strain of Candidatus accumulobacter phosphatus you have. Does 16S resolve this? No. Does polyphosphate kinase and alternative marker gene resolve this? Yes. Okay. Uh, 16S gives you a certain level of resolution. The intergenic spacer between 16S and 23S gives you more resolution. Long story short, paper from 2009, and they found that if they clustered these ITS, these more variable sequences, right, they differ from each other more, these are all from Prochlorococcus marinus, very important organism in the ocean. If you cluster at about 97 to 99%, you find strong associations between taxonomic diversity and nitrate concentrations in the ocean. If you cluster at 90% identity, you get associations with light, 95% temperature, and so depending on your taxonomic resolution, you can actually find associations with different environmental variables. RDP taxonomy is hideous, but we live with it anyway. Uh, OTUs, well, you'll be hearing enough about operational taxonomy units later. They're a nuisance, but again, we use them. Uh, and because I need to finish up, functional predictions are a pain. We could talk about this later. This is the critical, annotation, uh, critical assessment of functional annotation. Functional prediction methods for proteins, not doing so well. Getting better, but there are some limitations there. So all these hypotheticals, still very difficult to predict. Okay, so in conclusion, we're on a coffee break and networking session. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm going to give you a minute. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them. We're going to take a deep breath, and then we're going to move into the tutorial.